I was about 11 years old, but little did I know that my life was about to change forever. It was a milestone, a dream come true, and for weeks leading up to it, I was excited. I was having, uh, I was waking up in the morning, pumped up, dreaming about this at night, anticipating, and my life would never be the same because Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace, was about to come out. And I don't know about you guys, but for people like me, that was a big deal. And I realized that in 1999, some of you guys were just like freshly wombed. But for, for me, I had been waiting all 11 or 12 years of my illustrious life for this moment, the Phantom Menace. And there was going to be races, and there would be mystery, and there would be spaceships and special effects. But best of all, there would be one thing. The lightsaber battles. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen those epic intergalactic sword fights, the kind that give you goosebumps and you have no idea why. You're like, man, that's dangerous and I want to do that. It was so exciting to look at and, and th they were just everything that I hoped for and more. In fact, uh, let me just turn one on real quick. I put it down because it was kind of distracting to just have this dude like chilling up on the screen. But um, all right, so. Things like this going on, you know, and as a kid, I'm watching the screen, I'm like, oh, snap. Um, you know, and, and they're jumping around and doing crazy things, and there is literally nothing more exciting on Earth. In fact, I had to turn, you know, not turn on the music for this, because I wasn't sure you guys could handle it in the morning. It's so intense. So intense. It's, a, it's amazing. And 11-year-old me thought that everything about this was amazing. So amazing that not only did I want to watch this movie, but I actually wanted to be a part of it. I didn't just want to see these guys do this sweet aerobic fancy dance. I wanted to be swinging one of those laser sword lightsaber things for myself. It wasn't enough to watch. I needed to be a part of it. I needed to get my own lightsaber. I, I had to have one. It, I, it, was, it wasn't a want, okay? It was a need. It was a need. And I went back on the internet, which was really slow back then. I mean, really slow. It took like 20 minutes to load up a picture of a lightsaber, but it was worth it, okay? And I would go on there and I would look for where I could buy one and find out all the stores, but there was a problem, and that was that my family lived out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, nowhere. It's an hour to a Walmart. Very far from anything. But once we found out where you could get a lightsaber, I had one mission, and that was to convince my parents that they needed to take me there so that I could get a blue Obi-Wan Kenobi lightsaber. And not just to hit my sisters with, but to save the world with. It was going to change everything. I was doing the world a favor. And so, eventually we went. My parents caved into all the pressure and whining and begging and poking. And we went to go get a lightsaber and, you know, open the, the door, or I guess in those kind of stores, the doors open for you. Pss, ran in, went to the place, looked, found the aisle, turned, and they were sold out. Heartbreaking. Soul crushing. But I had just watched Star Wars, so I knew that a Jedi Knight wouldn't whine about something like this. That a Jedi Knight couldn't possibly cry too much about something like this. All right, so I was like, Mom, Dad, we need to go to a different store. We've got to go to a different store, but we were running out of time or it was too far away, and it just couldn't happen. So I was distressed. I was hurt, and my dreams were put on hold. But this deadly toy weapon was sold in other stores. And so I looked for another store online, and eventually we found out another place where they sold them, and after more begging and more asking and more being altogether bothersome and annoying like every 11-year-old boy should aspire to do, <laughs> we finally went to another store and we did not come home empty-handed. After traveling and working and longing and begging and saving and dreaming and most of all hoping, I finally got it. It was a little, little something like this. You guys might have seen it. Are you in awe? It's pretty amazing. Ah. You had to push the button. 
Ah, and you don't touch this part because if you do, it will cut you. It is dangerous, okay? So we finally got one of these and the, all the hype paid off. It was amazing. I got my heart's desire. I owned what I longed for. Imagine this isn't happening. I just need to stretch it out a little bit. Um, I got what my heart longed for. A lightsaber just like this. This one actually belongs to Ansel. Mine was blue, not beat up purple. But, um, but I finally got it. And while this story seems long and potentially pointless, it actually does have a point because the thing is that even though it was goofy and this toy seems trivial, the fact is that I was seeking it with every part of who I was. That I was seeking after it with all of my heart. That I was putting the desire for this <laughs> first in my life. Because I had seen Star Wars and my life had been changed. Okay, now I don't need that toy anymore. I found out that it doesn't really do what I thought it was and I can't do backflips. So, <laughs> I didn't make it as a Jedi Knight. I flamed out of the academy. It wasn't a great experience for me, but that's a story for another time. But, I persisted in trying to get what I desperately wanted I, and eventually we chased it down. And with the help of, of my family and their minivan, we were able to get the lightsaber. And this is exactly the way that God calls us to seek after him in the Bible. And we're going to talk about four ways that God calls us to seek after him today. And I'm just going to read through four verses really quick, and then you can turn there in a second. Um, I'll give you more time. This is going to be rapid fire. But God calls us to seek after him first. Matthew 6.33, Jesus says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything that you need. The Bible also calls us to seek God with all of our hearts. In Jeremiah 29, verse 13, it says, If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. And God calls for us to look for him persistently. In Luke chapter 11, verses 9 and 10, Jesus is talking and he says, And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives. And everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. And the last way that we need to seek after God is right here and right now. In Acts chapter 17, verse 27 we can read that God's purpose was for the nations to seek after him and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. And though he is not far from any one of us. The verse here is Matthew 6.33 if you want to look it up. And really it's an amazing promise. It says that if we seek after God first and live for him, then he will give us everything we need. Now, do you guys know what the word everything means? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, it means everything. Like, every single thing that you could possibly need, God will give to the people who seek Him first and live for Him. The God of the universe, the one who holds everything together, the one who is more powerful than anyone or anything, promises to take care of us if we seek Him first. The sad part is that so often we don't do that. So often we put other things before God and then we might think about fitting him in in our spare time. We might think about squeezing him in somewhere if we possibly can. And these other things that we put first could be anything. School, popularity, relationships, friendship, money, comfort, fun. Fill in your own blank. We put all kinds of things before God and these things take precedence in our lives over him. And often we fall short when we're trying to be his followers because we don't seek after him first. And we know that we often fail to live righteously. And this stands in such magnificently stark contrast to the way that our God treats us. We read in 1 John 4.19 that we love him because he loved us first. In 2 Peter 2.24 it says that Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So our great God chose to put us first and to bear our sins in his own body on the cross so that we could die to sin and live for righteousness. Our God put us first. That's some strong love at a high cost. And we need to respond to it. We need to respond to him 
by seeking Him first in our lives. But it's not enough for us to just seek God first. We need to seek Him with all of our hearts. And the next verse we want to talk about is in Jeremiah 29, verse 13. And in this verse it's clear that when we seek God wholeheartedly, we will find Him. When we run after Him and His will without letting anything hold us back, we will find God. And Christians, we love to talk about Jeremiah 29, 11 because it, it promises us a good future and a hope. And we should talk about it. That's right. Because it's a great and it's an encouraging verse. But we often forget that it's coupled with a requirement. That it's coupled with a command. And it says that if we're to find God, His will, His plan, and His blessing, we need to be people who are wholeheartedly, completely seeking after Him. And that means to set aside every other goal, every other desire, everything else that makes you tick and say, God, I'm going to be living my life for you and you only no matter what. Nothing's going to stop me from living for you and from, nothing's going to stop me from loving you because nothing stopped you from dying for me. God didn't even let our own sinfulness, our selfishness, our arrogance and our pride, our evil our brokenness, keep us away from Him. And we absolutely deserved death and hell. God said, I love you too much for that. I'm willing to lay down my own life to make a way for you. And He sought after us. And so when the Bible calls us, and when God calls us to seek after Him with all of our hearts, it's only in response to what God has already done for us. So let me ask you, Consider what is competing with God for your affection and your attention and your devotion. What keeps you from being a wholehearted seeker? What keeps you from following His will? Because we need to see those distractions for exactly what they are, and we need to get rid of them. We need to destroy them. We need to break away from them, because anything, even good things, if we put them in the place of God, can be used as a tool of our enemy to distract us from what our lives are really all about. And that's just one thing. The glory and fame of our God. But it's not enough even for us to seek Him first and to seek Him with all of our hearts, but we need to do it persistently. Jesus tells this awesome story in Luke 11. He says that there's a neighbor, um, two, two guys who live next door to each other, and uh, one of these two neighbors has uh, some guests come over in the middle of the night and that neighbor, because he's probably a dude, has nothing in his fridge. He's got nothing to feed them. Okay, so he's got no stuff to share with his guests, and they're all hungry. It's the middle of the night, and they need something to munch on. So he, this neighbor goes over next door, and he starts knocking on his neighbor's door in the middle of the night. So he's knocking, 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 and the guy's like, go away. It's the middle of the night. My whole family's in bed. What are you doing? Like, who knocks on somebody's door in the middle of the night to ask if they have some Triscuits, you know? But this guy's doing it, and he doesn't stop. He keeps knocking, and he keeps knocking, and he keeps knocking because he wants to feed his guests. And the Bible says, and Jesus says, that ultimately the guy gets up out of his bed and gives some food to his neighbor. Not because he's his buddy, not because he's his friend, but because he was massively annoying. As we said, because he just kept on knocking. And you guys who have siblings, you understand what it's like to experience massively annoying. My sister Jessica and I were just talking uh, yesterday about uh, my sister Erin. Erin, you should watch this message. Um, and how when she was younger, she would sing in the car so loud and purposely badly. And she would sit in the back seat Okay, so if it was like this, and here's the seat, and here's my head, and here's Jessica's head, and somewhere way up in the front is my brother Sean's head, because he was too big to fit in the back. And um, not that he's obese, he's just tall. Um, and she would lean forward, and she would go, You are my sunshine! Or whatever she was singing, and Jessica and I would be like, Aaron, stop! And she'd be like, You interrupted me. <laughs> I'm going to need to start this over. <clears throat> and then she would crank out another one. You know, right there. She was really, really good at being annoying. And that's... I love you, Aaron. Um, okay, so... What, 
what this neighbor was experiencing was like my sister knocking on, knocking on his door in the middle of the night. And so eventually he goes, I can't stand this anymore. I cannot stand this. I'm trying to, you know, get some sleep, but this guy is just out of control. So he comes and he gives him some food and he has been persistently annoying. He's been persistent in asking for what he needs, but he finally gets what he's after. And the Bible clearly states that he does it, that the, his neighbor gives him what he wants because he was persistent in asking. And Jesus caps the story off by telling us that just like that, we need to keep seeking, keep asking, and keep knocking because when we are persistent, in asking God to work in our lives, to give us what we need, and to help us to live for Him and for His glory, He answers our prayers. Our God responds when we are persistent in asking Him. So consider, are you someone who seeks God like that? Are you a person who's persistent in prayer? Do you regularly and constantly go to God and continue to ask Him to work in your life, ask Him to speak to you? You know, and we just want things to be easy a lot of times. And we want things to happen on our schedule. And this idea of praying persistently or seeking God and His will persistently is foreign to us in a lot of cases. It's not something that we are interested in doing. We feel like, man, I should, you know, just pop this prayer in the microwave, put it in there for a minute and 19 seconds, and then, you know, when it's done, bing, it's done, and I finally get what I want. Nice and toasty and buttery. But, uh, but that's not how it is with God. We need to persist and trust that when God does answer, he will answer in the best way possible because the God who was willing to die for us because he loves us is also willing to answer our prayers because he loves us. So we need to seek God first. We need to seek him with all of our hearts. We need to seek him persistently. And we also need to seek him here and now. We read Acts 17:27. And it's phenomenal. And it says, God's purpose was for the nations to seek after him and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far away from any one of us. And I don't know if you guys hear that, but when I read that, I get excited because I recognize that this is saying that God's plan for all people is that they seek him, reach out, and find him because he is close to all of us. And you guys hear this? He is not far away. Your God is near you. And this means that we don't have to wait to start following him more because he is here and we can do it now. And this means that we don't need to go to some holy place to find him. He's here and we can do that now. And it means that we don't need to fear that we'll never be good enough or know enough to find him because he is here. And he doesn't say, hey, come chase me down. He says, I came to you and I am with you. Just reach out and find me. Reach out and I'm there for you. Turn to me. I'm not going to hide. And this is ultimately the nature of what the gospel is. That our God came close to us. That he was in his glory. That he was in heaven. That everything was perfect around him. But because he loved us, he chose to leave that behind and become a man. And live with sinful and broken people like you and me. And ultimately pay the price for our sins by dying on the cross. And he paid that price and ultimately he rose from the dead so that he could ensure that you know he has the power over death. And when he tells you he can give you eternal life, he can back that up because he can walk out of a grave. Our God did so much to come close to us. And so when he asks us to seek him, we should respond. But it gets even better. It actually gets so much better because God is with us now and he's helping us and leading us. He's guiding us. In John 14, Jesus says this, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And this is so encouraging because we can know for a fact that God didn't just come down to earth as a man and then leave us behind. He hasn't left us alone here to struggle and fail. But he's left his own spirit in us and with us. 
And Jesus continues on later in this chapter. And he says, All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. And this is great news. That God is with us and that he's here and that he's on our side. So we don't have to be afraid. And this is God's answer to one of our most foundational questions about what it means to follow him. And that is simply this. Can I really do it? And I don't know if you guys have ever asked this question, but I hope that you will. Because so often in following Christ, we fail. And that leads me to ask this question. Can I really follow him? Because we see that we are weak. And we see that we fail. And we wonder, can I really seek God first? Is that really possible? And we see that our hearts are drawn to so many lesser things. To so many things besides God. And we ask ourselves, can I truly seek him wholeheartedly? And we understand that we are impatient and that our faith is so often the weakest aspect of our personality. So we think, God, can I truly be persistent in seeking you when I don't see the results in my own life? And we know that we're doubting people. We know that we question. So we ask, God, are you really there? Are you really here? Are you really working in my life? But God knows where we are. He knows where you are and he understands your struggles. And so he left us, the Holy Spirit, his own spirit. And he guides us and encourages us and he is here with us. God with us. When we read about Emmanuel, Jesus coming to earth, God with us, that should give us goosebumps. But when you read about the Holy Spirit, God in you... Man, that should just change your life. That should get you so excited and amped up because God, the King of Kings, the Lord of the universe, the one who invented your personality and the one who has made a way for you to live forever, that God is alive in you. And if that's the case, why would we be afraid? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? So we need to seek him first. We need to seek him with all that we are. And we need to seek him co constantly and consistently. And we need to do it now. Because God is here and he wants to be working in your life. He died so that he could live with you. And there's an awesome section of Psalm 62 and I'm just going to end with this. And it says simply, Let all that I am wait quietly before the Lord. For my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. My victory and honor come from God alone. He is my refuge, a rock where no enemy can touch me. O oh, my people, trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart to him, for God is our refuge. And it is phenomenal to know that we don't serve a God that's far away, that's up in heaven somewhere looking down at us, disinterested about our lives, but that our God has come close and that our God is with us and that our God is in us. And so when he gives us this call and he says, seek after me, and he says, follow me, and he says, do it even when it's hard, even when it costs you, and even when it hurts, we can know that through His power, it is possible. And ultimately, He is our refuge. He is our reward. And He is our only hope. You have an incredible God. Don't allow yourself to f flow through life seeking after other things that are only going to let you down. The God that, that you have and the God who loves you wants to be near you. He wants to be near you. Will you choose to be near him? Let's pray. 
Dear Jesus, we just thank you so much for who you are and for what you've done for us. And God, we thank you that you have come close to us, that you haven't just left us here on our own, but that you are, God, you are our God and that you have chosen to live in us. And God, I just pray for these students today that they would choose to follow after you with everything that they are. That they would choose to throw away lesser loves. That they would choose to persistently chase after you. That they would choose to put you first. And God, that they would choose to seek you, to love you, to honor you, and to follow you with every part of their hearts. God, there is no other, there is no one else like you. There is no other God who can do what you can do. And there's no one who's shown us love like you showed us on the cross. Help us to respond. Work in our lives. Because we know that you are a great God and we want to be your people. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.